Thank you. Okay, dear friends, hello. I'm sorry for a slight technical glitch, but now we're back online. I'm very, very happy to uh, greet you all uh, during our continuous educational sessions. Today is uh, presenter and guest, my dear friend, uh, Philip Davidov from St. Petersburg, and an iconographer, art critic, and just a very nice fellow. And I'm sure that today we're going to learn quite a bit so without wasting too much time, please enjoy uh, Philip's presentation. I, on my part, want to say that we are um, uh, conducting these sessions on Sundays, usually around uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, New York time. And we already have quite a few interesting guests and planning to have more. We do discuss sacred arts, church archeology, span church history, um, other some contemporary issues, so please join us. All the recordings of our meetings are published on the YouTube channel under my name, which is Ilya Gatlinsky, and myself, an Orthodox priest. I serve in Binghamton, New York. And um, we're doing this for the duration of last year and hope to continue to do them. But today, Philip, uh, Mike is passed on to you, so is camera. So we all attention. Uh, once again, since few people join after I made the first announcement, microphones are turned off. If you'd like to ask any questions, please send them via chat. Or after Philip's presentation, you are most welcome to raise your hand. I'm going to turn the microphone on and you can have a verbal interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Father Ilya. And uh, first thing I have to say, it's a great honor to be invited to such a huge audience to people whom I never knew. I never met and also have to say greetings to those who do know me and especially to Peter and so other people from the other side of the world who is having like 2, 2 a.m. or 4 a.m. So special thanks to everybody. And thank you. Thank you for joining. Uh, well, for those who know me, it's no need to say that my Main target, my main goals in all my lectures, in all our courses, is to rather raise questions than to answer them. So I will try to show as much as I can, giving some structure, but yet try to remi uh, remember the names, memorize the names, and maybe you need to Google things because I can't cover too much in one lecture. So there will be the historical part, which starts from the beginning of 20th century. And then we go through certain periods of, I don't know, Soviet time. And then we arrive to 21st century, where we'll discuss, well, where I will show some images of different masters of mostly Russia. And welcome to think about some questions which you may pose at the end of, of the lecture. Sorry for talking so much. All right, let's start right away. And yes, I think I need to share the screen. So this is our main plan. The plan which should be followed during all this process of the lecturing. And I'll go through these points, but my main concern is that you rather try to think what are the particular qualities of images you'll be seeing in this special uh, time because the images present the time, the images present personalities and they are a portrait of the time. So let's move forward and see, oops, sorry, just another question here. Let's start from somewhere because technically what we used to think of an icon which is a traditional sacred image, is an image with hello and a name and title on it. So when we think of the image with the title, we think that we have to know who is represented. And this question, this image represents quite clear image of Jesus and we even see the title Jesus. And we can say it's a contemporary icon in some senses, in many senses. And yet, what's the difference? Why can't we put it in every church and say it's some great spiritual treasure? Let's try to see what can be the means, what are the means iconographers operate to make their images function in the best possible way. How to make images become part of the church space and how they traditionally 
arrived to the 21st century. So what happened before? We can say that by the beginning of 20th century, we can see two different streams. First is the images which you see on your left hand. Iconographers, even living in 1903 or 1895, would take some ancient models and try to make their own renderings, make their own copies, showing what they see in the old models with their understanding of what models of old models are. And the other image on the right, <coughs> sorry, was made, was produced by an artist who was educated at Fine Art Academy, Vasnetsov, and there was another bunch of artists who studied in Fine Art Academy is academic, realistic, any other kind of highest possible education of art in their time. But looking at the medieval images, they were inspired to create something similar, something which would function in similar means. And these guys try to exploit these old sources, but try to also invent many of their own things. So we see the sketches of the same, I think, Vasnetsov for some church mosaics. And we see them also as figurative images. For some extent, they do look realistic. And yet, they're not so historically realistic as we used to see images of the 19th century. So it's not classicism, it's something different. And it's what we used to call the Art Nouveau, or it's a version in Russia, and what we can say belonging to the same movement as would be in any other country in the world. So this is a sketch which Vasnetsov has produced in 18, I see 85, maybe I'm wrong. And let's move forward and see how it was put in practice. So it's a period which we cannot neglect. There were artists who tried to work as artists in church, trying to produce something new to change the way which the craftsmen worked and to imply their personalities. This was Paul Pavel or Paul Corin, which later became an artist who painted lots of portraits of very famous people, but he started his learning as iconographer and he produced things like that in the beginning of 20th century. So we see the same features. And in Russia, in many other places, while this is not far from Moscow, we could have seen lots and lots of images produced in which now we'd call start of style Art Nouveau, if, if we just could have lived peacefully. If Russia could have survived certain periods of history without being almost totally demolished. So we see rests of this huge style and beautiful images by artists in many places, but these are only ruins. These are only pieces which remained. And we can probably give the best example of this style. It's in Moscow, not far from Tretikov Gallery, Novodevichi, no, sorry, am I wrong again? I'm, I'm, no, Marfo Mariinsky nunnery and it's a great example because this church was re restored recently maybe i don't know 10 20 years ago anyway what we see from the first glance from the first outlines which we can capture it reminds pretty well something medieval some i don't know something between 12th and 14th century russia but when we start looking at the details we start seeing more we start seeing how the details are not exact replicas of what was produced in the ancient time. We only see things which are made by our contemporaries. These people who have created these things, they did produce the impression of the old, of old pieces, of old images, but they produce things with new means. They could have utilized contemporary machinery of the beginning of 20th century and many other things, contemporary materials as well. So we see first, it's a facade of some medieval church, but when we start looking at these angels, we see they were made in Art Nouveau style. 
and we can say the same about all the details of this church. It's an angel, but first we see how it's produced. It's no more strict Byzantine angel. It's something borrowed from Byzantine, but it's a new piece. And there are lots and lots of things like that. And I wish we could have had this period continued. Well, what happened happened. Inside this church has these frescoes, which are quite colorful, colorful, and also the icons, which also were produced in the beginning of 20th century. But have a look at them, how dark they are. So that was the habit, that was the tradition. Everybody was used to see icons as something very dark. That happens, you probably pretty well know that icons mostly were covered, were sealed with linseed oil, linseed oil which was boiled, and they probably decided that that's the base, that's the best sealing, so they were using it for centuries and using it, and all the images were getting darker and darker all the time. So everybody used to icons to be dark. That's one of the photographs I got from the internet, and that's how the frescoes look. So these images look much brighter because they were not considered icons. So they were made as wall paintings, which could be, which were allowed to be colorful. That's an interesting thing. So this is Patriarch Cyril celebrating liturgy and you see how dark are the icons in real space, in real time. Well, not only the frescoes and icons were produced, there existed an entire enterprise producing furniture and vestments and iconography and also reasons for icons in hundreds of pieces. So we see these things we can also call Art Nouveau, but we also can say it's a craftsmanship. It's a high quality craft made with drawings made by artists. And the artists were probably having positions of our current designers. So they were producing design and they were craftsmen who worked with, with that. And when we look at these images, we understand it wasn't just a little shop which was producing it. It wasn't a single little workshop or studio which would be able to produce this. It was a huge enterprise funded by the state, funded by the Imperial family. So Imperial family was interested in promoting, in uh, helping the contemporary church art to exist. And again, it's the iconoceses with very light rizas with silver cover on the icons or other details, but the icons, look how they are. They are dark. So even produced recently, they are produced dark right away. And this is one of the objects I've taken photograph in our museum of religious, uh, prop no, what was it in Soviet time? Anti-religious propaganda. Now they keep it. And this is the ghost build, which was produced in the same time. Again, the same feeling. Ancient, but when we start looking at it, we see how contemporary, how modern or art nouveau it is. Well, what happened, happened. And after that, we can easily guess no further highest, I don't know, support existed anymore. So the churches were demolished and most of images were physically destroyed. So they were carried away from, from churches and they were burned, they were used for other purposes. So at the end, we only have very little part of what used to be in Russia before the revolution. And those who used to draw or paint or write stylized icons, these guys had to do something. They had to find their bread and they started producing images <clears throat> which could serve for everybody, like maybe highest class souvenirs at their time, but later they started to become a mainstream of souvenir. And this is Palek, Kholui, and their other uh, villages inhabited by iconographers. So people produce things like that using the same skills, the same 
iconography they used to use in icons, but they, in this case, utilize them for new motifs, for contemporary understanding of what is an image and how it should look like. Well, things like this do exist and it's our history. And it seems to be borrowed from an icon, but again, the motifs are different, even like this one. I'm not sure it's the best way to show it here, but that, that's what we see. That's what we see as our history. And there was other part of iconographers who didn't produce uh, images in series in dozens, like these guys used to produce. Those whom we can call artists had to immigrate, most of them. And now we can speak about iconography in immigration and it's a very special time. First of all, it's France because that's the country where most of Russian, uh, I don't know, thinkers or humanitarians moved. Among these special different places, I should mention, I can't pronounce the name of this place, but I should mention the name of the person. And this person's name is Gregory Krug, is one of the most famous, and I think most among the greatest iconographers of the 20th century. So in his work, he continued the tradition. He tried to borrow all qualities an image has to possess to be an icon, to be a sacred, to become part of the liturgy. But from the other hand, we can say that this person is working as an artist. So he's introducing, introducing new means, new special approaches, which he thought were necessary for his particular images. He lived, for, he lived quite a long life for an immigrant who had a difficult health issues, but he is a real genius who produced further generations of iconographers in France and many other places. And Leonid Uspensky, together with Grigory Krug, are probably the most eminent, most serious figures of <coughs> Russian uh, iconography abroad. Unfortunately, the church I'm showing and some other churches don't have any specific climate, I don't know, conservation devices. And their technologies were not perfectly wonderful. So there is a great possibility that in some dozens of years, all these frescoes will be just destroyed by cl climate. Yet we can see them. We can see what we can see, even though the title, so the, the writing you see was renovated. So the brightest red color on these images is something new. It's added later. And in another Russian short, I have never possibility to pronounce names. I'll have to ask for your forgiveness, if you're really interested in knowing where is this one and where that one, I will write it or tell it later. So this is in Paris, used to be a little, I don't know, apartment or garage, which was turned into a little church. And, and I think most of these icons were produced by Leonid Uspensky. And I think even with very little amount of money and very, I don't know, constraint in their means, they were able to create a very peaceful and spiritual space for prayer. Because that amount of gold, that amount of decoration allows to really focus in what's most important in celebration, not on beautiness and not on decoration. So I just love these little churches and how essential they are. And of course, the icons were mostly little. They wouldn't have much gold or any other specific material decoration because of the time. But we can speak about the uh, expression these iconographers tried to achieve. So it's not just a face copied from some old icon. It's not a portrait of Christ. It's something which was turned into an icon. So it's such a specific approach to an image of human face, which allowed the iconographer to make it image for prayer, to make it become concentratable at, to make it become meditatable and talkable too. 
So these were their works. They're all slightly different. They were all made with this creative approach, trying to borrow what was possible from old icons and what was necessary to change to make image function was changed. And this probably will be the last image of Gregory Krug I'm going to show you now, because, well, there are lots of them and you can Google, but I just wanted to show this as probably most, hmm, the one which transmits most luminosity, the brightest one, which I think is just greatest. Well, no, oh, I have a little more of them. Some of Leonid Uspensky as well. Good, it's good. I'm happy I can show them too. Well, there is another church and I'd like you to see that on the back wall of this church, we see a little painting made by one more very important person in Russian immigrant society, Russian immigrant iconographer. Oh, how could I forget your name? Okay, just a moment. My goodness. All right. Well, yeah, I really do have problem with names. And I think we should slightly start moving forward and I should remember her. Joanna Reitlinger or Reitlinger, Joanna Reitlinger. She also was a great person and she lived for a certain period of time in Paris and helped some parishes with iconography. And after a certain period of time, I think after the war, she returned to Russia and <clears throat> she became a spiritual daughter of Father Alexander Main at the end. So she was the person who lived in both countries, France and Russia. And you see the same approach here. We see some highly, I don't know, um, glossy surface of metal and very dark icons. The ones which make you make an effort to come forward and to look at and to see what actually is represented on that. So we don't see easily everything. We are forced to make an effort. And yes, there are lots and lots of these ancient, well, 20th century, not very ancient, but mostly icons. And you see how humble they are, how little and humble were these iconographers who lived in very constrained circumstances. And how we can see this as a work of art and at the same time work of art trying to be as much an icon, as much a sacred image or liturgical, having liturgical significance as possible. And this is an image of an icon produced by Joanna Reitlinger afterwards when she returned to Russia. So these were very little pieces and mostly they were produced for other spiritual children of Alexander Min. And she used to ship them in chocolate boxes because nobody would really care what's in chocolate box unless they'd like to steal, but not many people probably would. At that time, that was a really difficult one. So that was her destiny. Well, we're going back to Russia because it's really a very special period in our time when restorers started to reveal the old icons in their original state or almost original. It's beginning of 20th century again. We're talking about people who were, I don't know, who introduced themselves to icons by just clearing them. And I guess, I bet it's such a wonderful process because on this photograph of 1913 or something about that time, <coughs> we see how some routine Russian church could look like. Most icons covered with silver razors, especially if you have some money, and most of them are dark. So in the icon on your right hand side, you couldn't probably identify the Trinity or Rublev if you were in that church because by that moment, people mostly would see the decoration applied on top rather than images which got darker because of linseed oil. And even when they just started clearing it, they saw the board 
painted over. So there was another iconographer who painted on top of Andrew Rublev with garments and other faces and other details, more coherent, more contemporary for their time. So that could be kind of a reconstruction, what they saw after having cleared it. And yet it's a miracle. Imagine yourself discovering a treasure which has been hidden for, I don't know, 500 years. How about that? And of course, when after these dark colors, dark image covered with Riza, you see something like this, you get, I don't know, you get shocked. <laughs> you really can feel totally inspired. And I think that's what happened with Juliania Sokolova. So now we are speaking about non Juliania, her followers and followers. That's the question. Because what she did, she happened to be the personality very unique in Russian, I don't know, Russian situation. Because when she first revealed, together with other restorers, this image of Trinity, I guess she was so inspired by seeing what she saw that she decided to dedicate all her life to iconography, to Christian art of medieval time, which she could have access to in Russia. Well, remember, they didn't have colorful books or internet or any other sources. So what they saw, they saw with their own eyes only. And she started traveling in different little places. She became a restorer and she tried to make these sketches from old images. So she was, I can't say that she was copying. She was rather studying these images to understand how they were built, how they were produced and what were the main goals and means of these old iconographers. This is one of your icons and I can say she was very keen to make them traditional, to make them as similar and as traditional as possible for her. And yet, when we look at these images, we see they were produced by an artist who wasn't simply copying some gold or some green color, but who was trying to put together these different ingredients. So she was an artist who was learning how to be an iconographer with her own experience. So she learned this in museums and churches where as a restorer, she could have some restricted access. And when she was doing that, she paid highest respect to these old masters, considering them always the, her teachers, considering them always much higher than what she could imaginary, than what she could ever have become. And yet, looking at her icons, we notice some contemporary things. Like if you look at the top part of the board, you'll see that inner cave part, which is usual Kovchak and icons, she has asked to incise or create this incision for the halo for the figure in the border. I never saw anything like that on old icons. So that was something she introduced. And I guess she didn't introduce it to make it look contemporary or cool, but she thought it was appropriate for this particular icon. And she lived a long life. After a certain point, especially after the World War II, when they have reopened the Zag <laughs> Zagorsk Monastery, now this whole place is called Sergeyev Posad, but before in Soviet time, it was Zagorsk. And she created a little circle. She gathered little circle of people who wanted to be around her, to study iconography with her. It wasn't really a school with our understanding with classes and tasks for every week. I guess it was a circle of people who thought similarly and treasured the old art. And in her sketches, which she was producing, she also thought about her students. She thought how to facilitate their work. So she probably thought if they go 
in a group of 10 people somewhere in a remote church, that might be suspicious. Some people from the KGB or other organization may got interested. So she went there, she made these drawings, she brought them and showed to her students, to her, uh, I don't know what's the right term in English. In Russian, we can say similar thinkers. Anyway, and she was producing that as didactic material to facilitate their studies, to show them what were possibilities and what were the efforts of our predecessors, how they achieved these or this goal. And when she did that, we see that she never tried to make them look nice, to make them look perfect and wonderful because these were studies. Studies which she was sharing with her um, friends or people with her just to show them how things can be done. And when she was doing that, as a person who was educated in secular art academy, she used to have this feeling of contradiction of her regular education of fine art academy student and what she was learning from icons. So what she was discovering was very different. And she used to say that iconographer has to be different from a secular artist. So some people interpreted that as an iconographer has to kill an artist in himself. So becoming an iconographer, you have to neglect, you have to put away all your artistic background to learn from old masters. Well, what happened was this. When she was saying that, even producing these little simple copies, she was still acting as an artist who are thinking how this gray color could be combined with this slightly lighter highlight. What could be the combination and what would the ratio be? But what people after her produced, they turned these her sketches, her drawings, or this approach of making these linear drawings into the dogma. They started making these drawings as a beginning of all iconography process. So they started building up the whole process of painting an icon on this very fine, I should even say perfect, or having tendency to be perfect lines, thinking that they were following her. And they were also learning how to apply highlights and shadows in the same way she did. Even after she died, even after they gained hundreds of books and other sources of information, they continued these schemes for their specific work. And most iconography schools in Russia take this example of iconography school she has founded in Moscow Spiritual Academy in Zagorsk or Sergei Posad. They learn how to borrow details from old icons and put them together how to copy exactly the highlights and shadows on old icons and apply them on your icons. Because that is the method they think allows them not to be too much creative, but to be more faithful to the nature. No, sorry, more faithful to the medieval models and to what predecessors did. Well, what we can see if we try to compare her work with works of her followers who physically try to follow this dogma. When her icon is presented, or we can go to the Zagors and see her icons, we see it a work of art. We see how the colors fit each other, how the image works with this space and all other qualities a work of art possesses and all icons also do. When we look at this, we see how faithful she is to the tradition, but how free she is to slightly change means if they need to be changed.
But when we look at images of your followers, we see that they have a totally different goals because access to almost unlimited amount of gilding and other different means, these people produce copies of old images trying to be as, as precise as possible in what they understand is precise. In their understanding, the process from linear drawing, applying the basic layer of sun here and further making highlights and highlights and going on forward is the process with which any icon was produced in medieval time and is the process which guarantees sanctity and canonicity of an old mess of an old image. So I'll just show some very occasional photographs I've, I have from the School of Iconography. And these are guys who have great skills. So they know how to apply gold. They know how to draw very fine lines. But when I try to look at them from point of view, I used to look at old icons, like how they work, what they tell me, how they talk to me personally and individually. They want me to do something. I don't find any of this. I see that the blue this iconographer has chosen is a blue I cannot stand in front of for more than 35 seconds. And there are many other things which look like they are okay if you simply build one thing on top of another without worrying of people looking at your icon, if without people thinking of how you have achieved this or that. But when you compare the work of Nan Giuliania Sokolova and the works of her followers, we see there is a great gap. The gap is in the target, the goal. What she has produced has a goal to allow you to stop in peace and pray, meditate, and contemplate with this image. The image we see on the right contains dozens of figures, lots of gold and other details. But if I'm asked if I wish to have one of these two icons at home, I know that probably the one on the right can value, can cost much more financially, but the one on the left is a real icon, while the one on the right seems to be some, I don't know how to say. Well, it formally looks like an icon, but it doesn't function like one. That's what I feel is the main problem. And now we move forward to another moment, to another different part of our lecture, where I will speak about iconographers and exhibitions of iconography. It's enough with Nan Giuliania, who is a great person, and her students who produce this copies of details, I just want to speak now about personalities. And the brightest personality among iconographers of Russia of second half of 20th century is Father Zinon Theodor, who was born in 1953, who was probably most active and most flexible iconographer after Nan Giuliani, whom he knew, he knew her, who studied with her for a little while, but he was an artist after being graduated from art uh, lyceum, or I'm not sure if, it, if it's a college. He continued his work as an artist in iconography. And now I'm showing the works of his 1990s, so before the 2000. And I want you to show, to see this because of the integrity he could achieve, he achieved in this iconocity putting lots of different things together. So this tension, traditionality, and yet creativity and integrity together. Well, this is one of the icons he has taken and many of you can recognize prototypes which are quite traditional and yet they're turned into something you totally, re, uh, totally rethought, re, how to say, 
yes, totally reconsidered, but built in a very traditional way. And this is another iconosis of Father Zenon in, well, the previous was in Pskov. This one is in Pechori. It's a little monastery about 50 kilometers or 30 miles from, 35 miles from Pskov, where he used to live for a long period of time. And these were, I think, the periods of his greatest achievements when he already achieved certain professional or great professional level of execution. And yet he was an iconographer who was researching in the process of painting. And that's what we can see on his images. And later he started to become more and more professional and more and more, uh, I think I should use the word perfectionist in his works, trying to achieve the highest quality in anything he was painting. That was one of the earliest iconoses he produced also. And this image I'm showing you was produced by my dad, Father Andrei Davidov. I think it was also something like 1990s at one of the courses he taught in Italy. And I think my dad is one of the most important personalities of iconography of 20s and 21st centuries as well, because his researches and his personal dedicatedness to the process allowed him to make the, his images deep and powerful at the same time. Even though he had sources in different periods, he always transformed them to make them function fully as icons, not as some uh, stylization or copying, but really reconsidering everything as we mentioned, the same quality of Father Zeno. And we can say there were some other iconographers of generation who came to be icon artists in 1980s. From what I have heard from my childhood, from their, I know, discussions or chats, in this time, you could never even dream of earning any money with an icon. It was something so hmm, excluded from social life. So people were only producing icons for themselves. And this generation, when they saw first revival of religion in Russia in 19... Well, in late 1980s, they were thinking, they were hoping that this revival would follow the way they were following, going from uh, secular art, but coming to iconography, trying to understand what makes an icon an icon, how an image can be called an image for contemplation without being lost as an artwork at the same time. Because what we see in old imagery, we always see art working as a spiritual art. So, and for these iconographers, well, I should mention the author of this icon, which I think about one meter and something large, Alexander Lovdansky. And here I'm showing you icons produced by Irina Zaron and the carvings produced by uh, her husband, Sergei Antonov. So this was the generation of people who came to iconography in the 1980s. They were fully artists and were fully becoming iconographers. I'm trying to show, I can't show you the entire iconosis here because the space is too narrow. So the church is very narrow, but wide. And we see here the same qualities we used to see in works of Gregory Krug or Nan Giuliania. They are traditional and yet they're fully creative. This creativity is responsible and obeying the tradition. And I'm happy to show you how the artists were very delicate about working with different media. Like icons are much brighter and more active compared to the frescoes which we see above, which have to more, have, 
have to rather be considered part of architecture. So they were made much paler. And yeah, that's a better quality color. That's it. So Irina Zaron and Sergei Antonov. And now I'm going to speak about more contemporary period of time, which probably the very last decade of 19th century. Oh, sorry, 20th century, but for more about the first part of 21st century. And we cannot avoid mentioning these gentlemen, even if he is not Russian. He did influence iconography a lot because he was such a powerful personality who lived in Poland and created some very contemporary church interiors and some very contemporary icons. I think we should mention him because it's, of course, it, we had this iron curtain and the borders were dividing us. But when the Soviet Union started opening up, I know that iconographers started learning about each other and some people were exposed to what he was producing. So that may probably for some of you seem to be too contemporary. And yet we should consider always the goals which an artist may pose, which an artist is allowed to pose or is considered to have posed for himself or herself. Like why? Why does an image have to be traditional? Well, not to scandalize anyone. But if in some certain case, we wish the believer who comes to the church, not just to peacefully look at the reproduction of mother God of Vladimir and say, well, I've seen her so many times. There is nothing new for me. I will just think about my own things without really worrying about prayer. Probably in this case, we might need one little icon in the church, which would be like this, which will just force you to wake up and say, oh God, is he now, is he here? Is it happening to me? It's not a history, it's now. Wow, wow. So that probably was one of the motivations. I can't guess about that, but yeah. And we can speak about his work as work of an artist who is combining artistic skills with the tradition. But I can also say that in some cases, we might need to speak about his followers also, who try to utilize this avant-gardistic approach. And this, I would say sometimes for me, does remind of his work, but probably is not inviting my eyes to contemplation, is not, uh, is not talking to me in a visual way. It's rather, an indication on something, it's talking to my brain rather to my eyes. And that sometimes can become a difficulty because bringing together lots of symbolic meanings, we need to think how the symbolic meanings can be combined visually. And in cases like this, I can say that we rather guess what we see then we just simply see things. And this, I guess, is probably little going too far into intellectual understanding of what iconography is, rather than just to making an icon or continuing the tr tradition of iconography as it was used for centuries. Because here, for my understanding, I rather see some qualities of a poster than of an icon. So I could have shown you some images of similar type <coughs> of contemporary Russian iconographers, but I think this direction of development is rather carrying us to produce posters and not icons. And there is another direction for iconographers, which we see in especially last two decades or in the 21st century, because now iconography for many years has become official way of earning money. And lots of those who graduated from fine art academies or colleges, they started to work as iconographers. So 
they were taught how to draw portraits and how to draw human beings to make them look alike. And these people used their skills to show how similar the saints, especially the new saints, could look to their portraits. So yes, it's a good decision because we need to recognize them. But from the other hand, thinking of an icon, we used to see images which do not make us think too much about terrestrial values, about how exactly the, this or that person look like in terrestrial life. And the sixth century icons which we have from Mount Sinai, they do not look like portraits. They first of all are icons, are transcendent images of human beings which are recognizable and yet not too recognizable. They don't imitate photographs. And this is the direction I'm just describing because it does exist. We can't stop mentioning things like that. So this is an artist who is transforming his way of painting humans into iconography, trying to present us a three-dimensional image of Demetrius or some other saint for us to see it almost like a portrait and to be able to talk to it like to a portrait or images like that. I'm not saying it's produced in Russia. I'm just talking about general tendencies, which also in Russia do take place. And there are lots of my people in my country who try to make icons look like this. I have taken this Greek image probably as the best of the kind or that one as well. And now I think it's time to just discuss whether we need to make contemporary icon look like contemporary portrait with elements of an icon or probably not. And my thought, my idea and what I heard from people more educated than I, we should try to always make a decision. What do we want to achieve in our image? In the image on the right, the idea or the goal of the artist was to produce an image where we recognize very concrete details of appearance of a very concrete man. And on the image on the left, we are captured by something different, by the gaze, by the power of the image and by the energy which we grasp, which we can perceive from this image, not by documentary faithfulness to reality, but by altered reality, by altered in an artistic and a responsible way. And here I can give a parallel to art of, I don't know, 19th century, where we had two directions. The image on the left presented by anger could be the best illustration of how artists try to imitate reality achieving the most faithful result. I think that the precision this artist had was even much better than our eye could really capture from real woman. And another direction, which we see on the right, was to give mostly the energy to artistic power of the image, to how the image is functioning how it influences you and how it talks to you directly with its means. Not how it reproduces something we know, we can check every little piece. No, it's not trying to imitate reality. It's just talking to us by abstracted means, what real art used to be. And this is how I used to work with my models. You see in the middle photograph of St. Luke of Crimea, who even in Soviet time could be a very active bishop because he was a great surgeon. He was a very famous man and now he's really uh, respected by everybody. So now it's time to speak about how art of iconography can be seen by people because I've sp spoken about personalities, about different principles but how people can be exposed to images, how we can see them. And I was very 
honored to be invited for, to several exhibitions, and I'll share some photographs with you. So, in I think the first one I remember well, it was a huge building just next to Kremlin in Moscow, and that was a huge exhibition, Light to the World, in 2007. And I think there were uh, not hundreds, but yeah, maybe more than 100 of icons and different other kinds of images like embroidery, carving, architecture, mosaics, everything. And it was attended by a great number of people, lay people, people from the church. It was a great event. I don't know how did it happen, who organized it, but that was something very inspired in 2007. And well, here are Karnaukov's mosaics and many, many, I think every iconographer in Russia who had access to information about this exhibition was invited and participated in that. And Tikhonovsky Institute, so lots and lots. And after that, I should mention Professor Gregory Cordis, because even if he lived in Greece, he had this scale of his personality has. He is a great man who was interested in exchanging experiences with iconographers of different countries. And George Cordes invented this format of iconography symposiums where some institution, it could be seminary like here in Romania in Yasi, it could be some icon painting school like we used, like we did it the next year. So this happened in 2009. We made it in 2010. So an institution invites iconographers who are teaching. So those who can formulate their ideas and thoughts and they produce some images which remain property of this institution and they go back home. But the moment or these three days while iconographers work together, it's time of exchange. It's time of spiritual unity. And I should even say the professional unity for everybody, because even you work, if you work totally differently, I can learn something from you. And these were, I don't know, days without nights because we were always seeing each other's works, we were discussing, we were talking, we were trying to reveal something for ourselves. And that's what we did in St. Petersburg in 2010. Uh, this, uh, the person on the right is Anna Ilyina from Moscow. The person in the middle is Todor Mitrovich from Serbia. We'll mention him a little later. And here you see two backs, well, back of Filip Davidov and back of Olga Shalomov. Sorry for being showing my back. So Todor Mitrovic is one of the most famous iconographers of Serbia. And I think one of most contemporary ones, because as he thinks his goal is to be at the same time iconographer working within the tradition. That's the same image when it dried up. And from the other hand, he tries to introduce contemporary means into iconography. And I know lots of iconographers in Russia who were impressed by his work. He came several times to Russia and many people were exposed to his work. And here we see George Cordes painting one of his images here in St. Petersburg at the symposium, who was the one who has invented this format and to whom we are very grateful. And the work on the left was created by Slavica Mihailova, I think, yes, from Macedonia. And she was also one of the members of the team. So that was great, a great moment. After the time, I should mention an exhibition in Moscow in 2013, which was curated by three different people. The part from the side of iconographers was curated by Irina Yazikova and Sergei Chapnin. And the side which was from this uh, secular artist was by Gore Chahar. So what's the idea of this, in, of this exhibition? Uh, this Museum of Architecture in Moscow, about well, five minutes from Kremlin walking distance, it's very close, it's a very center, gathered together 
people who produced very traditional icons and who work with contemporary materials. Like you see on this image, this very strange veil produced by some contemporary artist trying to remind us about the veil of the Holy Virgin. But look at the materials. These are some, I don't know, scotch tape applied on some synthetics. And this gentleman is bringing his veils into different cities of the world. Like the middle photograph here is in Jerusalem. The photograph here is in some Russian countryside to remind us that the mother of God is covering earth with her veil. And there are many, many other artists and iconographers together. So that was the point, that was a moment when artists were invited <coughs> to see each other's works, not as contradicting each other, but to enrich each other. Iconographers were invited to see how free can be art in expressing even sacred things. And the contemporary artists, like here, were invited to see how essential and how responsible should be art in the church. This was one of the images we had in this exhibition. It presents uh, transfiguration. And I think that the idea of this collaboration was to show that, sorry, tradition is the source which enriches everybody. So we take iconography, we take type of imagery from the tradition, and yet we are totally free to think how it should be interpreted in our particular case, in our concrete, very special icon, fresco, or anything else to work well for the space we deal with. These two images, well, this one and this one, are, I think I should say frescoes. It's sand with polyvinyl acetate as a background, but they were painted on sand by Irina Zaron, whose iconosis I have shown you earlier. And this work of Sergei Nekrasov, let's move forward. And this is one of the icons of Olga Shalamova, my wife, who was also exhibited there, currently is Virginia Theological Seminary in Washington, DC. And that's one of your works as well. This is one of very famous artists of our time. She produces lots of images with lettering around. Lettering, lettering, lettering. Yelena Cherkasova, lots of uh, postcards and anything. These again were Irina Zaron, this is Anatoly Etenair. Well, lots and lots of artists. I just wanted to show you how different were the images. And there was also a video installation which was showing image of Christ in constant movement. And yet I haven't heard anyone attended this exhibition and there were thousands of people. We read the responses afterwards together. Nobody who would be scandalized so the mutual respect of people who participated was a great experience. That was my mom's work. She's working a lot with application, combining different types of fabric together. So Greg, George, and Dragon. And yes, that's who works again. So that's how the space looked like. And that's how the space could look like if this exhibition like that was some, produced somewhere else. Now I'm showing you another special piece, which we'll talk about a little later. This icon, sorry, this iconographer was asked to paint an icon of Serge of Radonezh. But not only he painted Serge of Radonezh, he painted lots of details. And here, as a second icon to this diptych, Seraphim of Sarov. And he also added some other details to this icon. So these icons which were presented were not simple reproductions, but they were creative researches, creative elaboration of traditional imagery. Sometimes we could find the prototypes, like this icon would have a very famous icon from Mount Athos as a prototype. Sometimes we don't, but the main thing was iconography as art. This image 
again is Todor Mitrovich, whom I've shown you in St. Petersburg Symposium. So lots and lots. And the one on the left are my Magi, different ones. And this was produced by the curator of the exhibition, Gore Chahal, where the uh, lamb printed with 3D printer was supposed to choose whether to become a real lamb with lambs, fur, or a wolf. He could have chosen any. So this was kind of art, which was bring us always to religious, to spiritual values. And that was contemporary. Well, let's quickly move forward because there are too many images. We can't cover them all. That was one of my works together with some sculpture image. And after that time, well, the pre this exhibition was 2013, 2014. After that, Olga and I, we were invited to make an exhibition in Wesley Theological Seminary in Washington, DC. And we brought some of our icons there. That was very special to have an exhibition in the seminary. And we tried to give as much variety of images as possible. And we are very grateful to our curator, Trudy Johnson, Trudy Ludwig Johnson, and to Deborah Sokolove and Amy Gray, who trusted us, who created this exhibition in a non-Orthodox seminary. That was very brave from their side. And we are grateful. And after that, I should mention one of the light, well, two latest projects I'm going to show you. This was one in Minsk two years ago now. It was a project which was started after uh, Patriarch Cyril met with Pope of Rome in Havana. And the project was entitled Saints of Undivided Church. So iconographers were invited to paint saints who existed before the division of the church. And there were lots of iconographers from different countries, from Russia, from Italy, from Australia, many different countries. And this project is still going on. I know there has been this extended version of this exhibition. After Minsk, they moved to New Valam Monastery in Finland. And they've been also in a couple of Russian cities. And here on the image, you see in the middle, Sergei Chapnin, who was, who is the curator of this project. And they also had different concerts and many different things. So this is one project. And the latest project we were also honored to participate is currently hanging in Moscow also produced by Gore Chahal, who started the first exhibition in 2013. Here again, here is Gore Chahal. And on the left from Gore, you see Alexei Lidov, who is quite famous person in Byzantology, especially in Russia. Here again, we see iconography together with contemporary artworks or iconography as a creative art together can be exhibited with something which is a tendency to be iconography, but doesn't have enough visual quality for that. So some images from this exhibition, which was called Biennale of Christ-centric art. You can Google, they do have a great website, lots of photographs. And some of them were very contemporary like this. When you approach this very strange I don't know, canvas with strange angles, you immediately hear sound like click and here below is the sensor of movements. So when you start approaching, it lights up. And when it lightens up, you see the image of an angel who only appears there when you approach it. So lots of different kinds of contemporary art together with traditional iconography like here, and like other images like that. Well, this staircase shows different virtues. 
Uh, no, my English is not enough to translate well. Well, some sketches, some icons, different, different kinds. And here is Olga's epitaphios uh, on top. And my mom's work, again, made up as a uh, application with addition of different elements. And now I'd like to speak about some individual images and show some icons as representatives. Not as I say, look, these icons are the best or these iconographers are the most special. I just want to give you some range of different images and I hope it may be helpful. Because from my understanding, when we start speaking about contemporary iconography, we, we keep in mind two directions. One is where we try to follow all the features provided by our model, like what we see on the left. I guess I can look for to try to be as faithful as possible. And another case, another possibility or direction or opportunity is when I part when I can look for having the same goal to bring our mind, our body, the whole being to most peaceful possible state and to invite our uh, soul to prayer. So I guess it also is possible to achieve even utilizing contemporary means and avoiding to make very concrete copies. So for me personally, when I put these two icons together, I would say that the one on the right from point of view of the power of the image, even though it doesn't show all the highlights and shadows in a very traditionally painted way, it is still more powerful because this iconographer worked thoughtfully and his dedicated was to arrive to the result. And the iconographer who produced the image on the left was trying to do his best or her best, I guess, I do not know who it was, but from point of view of the visual power, it's not as strong. And I just want to say that apart from iconography, there are lots of other possibilities, opportunities. Like on this image, you see some drawing, which Olga, my wife has produced on paper, and it does borrow some subject from medieval iconography, but not necessarily we have to execute it. We have to think of the final goal of an image to be an image for prayer. This can really be a poster I have mentioned in the beginning. It is made as a work of paper and it is a work on paper, which can be, I don't know, hanging in some parish house or somewhere else, but never meant to be an icon. So why not considering this direction, like this wonderful magi showing the star, they're not trying to demonstrate you a special peaceful mood which we need for prayer. They're illustrated. They are an illustration. What else they are? They just are an illustration. So looking at icons again and again, I always have this double dimension. First, I always compare images with what I used to see in tradition, in old icons, in old churches, which I attend. And the second is how this traditional understanding is transformed to make image talking, to talk to our contemporaries who lives next door, who may probably not know what was normal for the 15th century or what for what was normal for 12th century. This is work of my dad, Father Andrei Davidov. And I think his idea was to make this state of praying St. Julia influence us as she is praying to the mother of God. So we are invited to pray as well. And this icon, which I have shown you a little earlier of St. Serge of Radonish, who is known as for some extent, similar to St. Francis of Assisi, as he was also talking to animals and he was close to nature. So these 
artworks I'm going to show you now and I'm showing you now were made to talk to you directly. This is not Russian iconographer, as I mentioned, Todor Mitrovic is from Serbia, but I just want you to be introduced to most special images and events of the 20s or 21st century we can look at and we can be awakened by, because sometimes we do need this awakenness. So we do see some traditionness, but we also see that this image was produced by our contemporary person for our contemporary people. So he is talking to us, not pretending he's come, he has come from 12th century and doing everything exactly like it used to be. No, no, he's talking to me, he's talking to you. And he is reminding us that what happened to Saul on the way to Damascus was a real event. It's a not a nice, beautiful fairy tale. It was a life changing event, which completely devastated all his beliefs he had before and his pride as servant of Judaic religion. This is one of the favorite subjects of Todor Mitrich. So I'm showing it to you just to show the approaches can be different. And Further, I will show some of our works and mention a little bit the process we go through to arrive to the final result. And the final result, why has this or that look? Because for this case, I had a strange visitor to my studio who just walked with a dog and said, look, Philip, you know, I've seen your works on the internet and in my dacha, in my countryside house about I don't know, 500, no, maybe 300 miles from here, I built a little chapel. Can you paint a little cross for my chapel, which nobody will wish to steal? Can you avoid using gold, not to make it look expensive? I want it to be there for forever. Even when in winter I leave my summer house, I want it to stay there. And I thought, and I decided, why not? I used the surface of OSB, oriented strand board, as the highlighted color of the body of Christ and the usual egg tempera, which seemed to be quite resistant to temperature, to climate, which works, I think, well, because this expression is caused by a very particular uh, condition. He posed me the condition. He said, I want something which would not look expensive. Here it is. And after that, I had some other person who saw this image and he said, well, look, I have this iconostasis made of something red, very flat, these printed icons, but I want you to make an icon for us. I want also a crucifix, similar to what you did for that gentleman. And I started thinking, and it took me almost a year to arrive to the final result because I had to make several searches. Because at the end, I decided the best medium for this work to struggle with the flatness to win this artificial surface of the walls was the hot encaustic. And I painted this cross on raw wood. I tried to give it some raw texture as much as possible to give this materiality, to give the sense of natural presence of this object. Unlike other things which were all arti looking artificial. And now they are having this cross in the city of Tomsk in Siberia. And well, they say it, it works well in their church. And the image I'm showing here, I have been thinking of for a very long time because of my country having gone through very difficult periods of historical disasters. I was thinking how an iconographer who used to produce things for eternity, whose images are not supposed to call for emotions can somehow reflect in his or her image the time and the history of the country. 
And I thought that could be a good possibility, simply placing an image of Christ suffering behind the bars. And it's not my invention only, because there were lots of wooden sculptures produced in Russian, I don't know, cities, villages, which they used to keep in little cabinets in their churches. And these cabinets were only opening before the Easter to show Christ in prison. So I was only trying to put together the sculpture approach, the bars, and the traditional understanding of what image of Christ is. So all these images, which I'm speaking about, are part of a process because that's what we see in old times. We never see icons as simply a reproduction of something which existed before. We mostly see icons as a message when this artist is talking to his contemporaries and to us about very important things of his life, the concepts, the messages, the important thing he wants to deliver and to share. So in some case, you may need light background and very joyful color combination. In other cases, you may need something darker. In some cases, you may use some more fluent I don't know, outlines. In some, you may need more geometric. It's a process. It's a process of research. And the last three images I'm show, going to show you, sorry for such a long lecture. Uh, I was asked to work in this little church which was originally built as a chapel, to think how this empty architecture could be put in some, I don't know, could be transformed into a church without applying hundreds of icons. And I tried to think of minimum of important or necessary or essential things we should introduce into the church. I try to avoid any unnecessary detail, and I'm hoping that I was able to create a peaceful space which allows people to pray without being um, bothered. And that's how it looks from inside. So there are some mosaics, some fresco painting, but the main thing is the peacefulness, the peacefulness which allows you to be with yourself. And my latest, latest project, I'm like working now with is connected with the stone because I loved so much playing with the glass and stone tumbled in a concrete machine, that concrete mixer that I decided I use it further and further. And I made a project like this. And now I'm thinking I, I'm working with a project for a church, which the priest has called as having look of a military ship. Philip, are you ready to create an iconostasis in the church which looks like a military ship? I said, I will try. So now I'm trying. That's it. Thank you very much, Father Ilya, for calling me. Thank you very much for the possibility to talk. I feel that probably was talking too much about myself, about my own projects, but I guess it's just to show that the very work of iconographer is not to demonstrate your skills in applying the highlights and shadows, but it's a work of rendering the traditional values valid for people of our time. That is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Philip. Uh, thank you for wonderful lecture and uh, abundance of images. That's just spectacular. Um, uh, uh, I invite everyone to ask questions at this time. Meanwhile, we do have already three questions that have been sent during your presentation. I'm going to write them to you, and if you could please explain uh, mm -hmm. some of more of a technical nature. Uh, for instance, first one, please write down the names of the uh, French parishes shown. Do you have names for those places? Uh, maybe maybe well, you, yeah. if you can send them to me and when I post the recording of this lecture yes, on YouTube. That's the best. Yes, that will, be the best. Yep. that will be the okay. best. Yep. That will be the best, yes. So that way we'll answer the question and we'll save on time. 
Please explain how why the icons from the followers of Nan Juliania do not function like icons. I did not say that. I say they function differently. And I say when I compare them, I see a great difference in goals. The image produced by Nan Juliania, I see a clear goal for talking to us visually. To have, she has chosen all the means properly not to give any excessive information, not to make us guess about anything. She speaks very clearly to us and she's inviting us to a meditation with her images. The image I was showing to you, let me just jump back and share the screen again. Yes, ready to share the screen, sorry. Here it is. Ta-da! Yes, it's visible. So the image on the right presents a nice illustration of life of St. John the Cronstadt. This image demonstrates the chalice, his hand showing or the chalice because he is known as the one who introduced communion being taken every weekend. And we see lots and lots of details. But this amount of information does not allow a person to concentrate and focus in prayer because it's always been interrupted by the desire to look here and there and there and there. So our eye cannot stop, cannot focus. Our eye keeps wandering around because this artist could not figure out how to balance the visual means because this artist was not taught to do so. This is it. I'm not saying it's not working as an icon. I'm saying the one on the left is much better uh, accomplishing this task or mission or goal. Yes, thank you. Father Ilya, you're muted. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, please explain poster versus icon. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Just a moment, let me think, maybe again with a picture. Yeah, let me bring this uh, Magi again. Uh, okay. So, very good. Mm, if an iconographer had to make an icon of three Magi, an iconographer has to think of every detail helping to focus or not helping to focus. For example, we see these multiple little crosses on the frame. Do they help us to focus on prayer or not? They do not. Another thing, if you look at an icon, you usually see how perfectly space is balanced, how one part is explainable in connection with the other. On this image, I see no specific explanation for this part, except for these magi are part of a book. They are not supposed to be perfectly balanced for a fully peaceful look and for a fully peaceful dialogue with them. So they are a story. They are a story told to us but not an image for focusing. Because if you take an icon, okay, let's take an icon of Nan Giuliania, one of the latest artists. Shouldn't jump of this one. Well, no, here's a warrior. Let's take the warrior, he's more special. Okay, let's get back to sharing screen, sorry. So we see this warrior has lots of details. He has a sword, he has lots of different things, but how they are put together, we are not 
uninterrupted. We are not uh, distracted to analyze and discuss them because they all together create a beautiful hymn which we can sing in a church. So that's the difference between hymns and songs. I think we may sometimes sing a song in a church, but it's hard to say. Well, I'm speaking about my church, which is Orthodox, okay? But I'm not sure a song will always be perfectly greeted in a church since it functions according to different laws. It has different principles of functioning. A song is appealing to our, to our emotions while a hymn is rather trying to elevate our spirit to God. Well, maybe these are two rough words. They are too, too approximate, but they're, well, they can be said a lot. We can just discuss different genre of imagery we choose in this case or that case. Thank you. Muted. Yep. India, Dear friends, if there are questions, please, please send them in or raise your hand so I can turn you on. Uh, Philip, um, maybe a couple of comments, uh, uh, my personal observations, and you probably can comment on them. In, um, and maybe I'm very bold and maybe I'm very wrong, but looking at some of the icons uh, and iconography and architecture from 1970s and 80s here in the United States, and maybe even from 1990s, by the word contemporary, quite frankly, we see the inability to find the right talent. So um, uh, people were improvising, but the improvisations, although very genuine, but at the same time, very weak. And there is whole, maybe to much lesser degree now, especially with influx of people from Europe and much closer connections and revival of Christian uh, express Christian artistic expression in Eastern Europe and in the Balkans, this conversation slowly faded away and you can see much more beautiful examples, so much more wonderful examples, complex examples here in the United States. But uh, many people uh, who look beyond the quote unquote academic features was in the iconography of 19 early 20th century. And this uh, false naivete of the works of 1960s and 70s look for something uh, more recognizable in medieval Byzantine or Russian. Um, for them that uh, uh, constitutes climax of this beauty. And I mm -hmm. not once heard from your dad that you could not imitate Rublev endlessly. In fact, mm -hmm. when I was doing trips in pre-COVID times, we would inescapably visit your that's workshop and Susdal, right? And that's the phrase that he would always use and people would applaud to him. But really, really, um, uh, in the, to a large degree, up until very recent times, maybe 10, 15 years, desert uh, of artistic expression from the traditional sense, many people do find this classical expression of iconography as very climactic and very su uh, surprisingly relatable, not in a sense of um, uh, historicity or museum-like qualities, but in a very, very direct sense. Could you please comment on that? Maybe it's drift from something that is, again, oversimplistic, but in a very arrogant and strange way towards some, towards something more profound. My question is not to challenge what you've been trying to say, by no means, but it's like two journeys. One journey from seeming staleness of seeming canonicity toward finding of new artistic expressions. And another one is drift back from the relative obscurity of artistic expression to something that seems to be a classical height. Would you please comment on that? Uh, very good question, actually. It, it, it's, it's a challenging one as well. 
Well, but it, I, I'm not posing it as a challenge. I'm not it is. It, no, it really so. is. It really is. I've heard it lots of times, and I've heard it from especially uh, uh, editors of Orthodox Arts Journal, which say, well, you in Russia, you probably have too much of this tradition. You want to go further. But while here, we have too little of it, and we value every, every drop of it. So whatever we can gain, whatever we can get, we are happy with. So yeah, it, it's a right question. Uh, I don't know what to say, because I think the main problem is what does one, okay, no, let's put it differently. The, the, the purpose an artist, an iconographer poses while doing something is important. Like, what is, why are you doing that? And why are you doing it this way and not that way? Because very often what I see in iconography reproduced, it's a choice made without real thinking. So that's what I feel always sorry for and that what, what I don't feel tired to criticize. The, the question is, do you mean it, okay? So do you mean, to, is it your own understanding? Like for Nan Giuliani, who was very traditionalist and who sincerely produced the images she produced because she meant it. It was her choice to choose this brown color, to choose this size of the figure in the paradigm or in the traditional frames but working this way. So it's just requiring much harder work to try to re, how to say, to, okay, especially using synthetic pigments, mostly painting on canvas, which is glued up to the walls to paint exactly the same as artists in medieval time did. So the question is how you can be naturally following them in circumstances when your role is to be copying machine. That's it. So you are an artist as an instrument in God's hands and you know what your predecessors did. So you're supposed to learn from them, but to do things which are appropriate for your circumstances and which will be fully inheriting traditional values but which would still talk to people around you. I don't know, it, it, I think it's always very personal because there are images which are more uh, successfully fulfill this thinking on there are other images where iconographers just didn't have physical possibility to do that. So it, it very much depends on circumstances. I cannot say that or this. And of course, for people who have never been exposed to orthodox visual culture, like we are, I don't know, spoiled in Moscow's and Visenburg museums, any exposure to even not perfect or not highly professional renderings of these images can be helpful. So, Yes, yes and no at the same time. Um, somebody made a comment, I will allow myself to read it. One can love the Byzantine iconography and love the majority of new icons, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, well, um, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, a, remark, a remark to that comment is of course, and probably it will explain why my question coming in, I am leading sacred art tours to the classical places of iconography around Europe for past almost 20 years. I could not claim to be great specialist, but I've been to many places that probably are not mentioned by Ot Demius uh, in his phenomenal uh, volume, um, Romanesque art, right? So I do know what, what, what traditional iconography presents. At the same time, I'm good personal friends with many of the modern iconographers who work in very not so traditional Byzantine style, including Philippe Davidov, and we are, I believe very genuine and also many year friends. So my question is not from my personal perspective, but from those absolutely intolerable words that sometimes break even on my Facebook page when I post something. 
when really? you get a very very snotty remarks and uh, one can love one and one can love the other it takes a very big heart and a very open mind usually usually people select what to love like with political opinions or like with <laughs> outlooks on anything in life and i'm thinking we here have a very very friendly discussion and actually trying to fit both into one believing that christianity have by far much broader spectrum than you know personal preference and that in fact would lead to my next question um if i may and um let me just share my screen at this point um this of course is uh, very well known to you philip i don't know maybe to some of our viewers as well it's an icon by alex shurkus um, uh, representing apostle peter um, of course his denial and uh, you know that sitting by the fireplace you know very, very famous narrative of Lord, within the uh, frame of lord's passion um, can you see it Yes. Hello. Yes. 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 We can see yes. it. Can, yes. you, can yes. you see it? Yes. Right. So my my question my question in that regard my question is that regard to you personally in your personal opinion is it an icon or not? Because I've heard from equal number of people who saw it and absolutely love it because they so moved by it by just genuine expression of what's depicted the captivation of the image and others who say well it's just a religious picture that uses you know um, iconographical forms um, what would you what would be your take on it Philip what 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 would you think about it well I think the main word you have used was the word moved because that was the purpose I'm not sure the iconographer who painted Trinity or Mother of God Vladimirskaya or something else we know traditionally was wishing to feel us moved towards this image. Impressed, maybe. Somehow transformed, yes, but not moved. So that was the purpose in this particular message, in this particular image. And that makes the difference, because I'm not sure that iconographer is supposed to be movie. Otherwise, it's probably something different from what I used to see. I think if we try to analyze the genre of this type of imagery, it's illustration. Because why would he need the borders he goes off the borders all the time. He has the peacock on the, no, the, uh, he, uh, he has, cock, the, yes. he has the cock on, on the border. He has the, we, uh, the smoke going off the border. So why, why it has to be an icon? That's not the question. There are hundreds and hundreds of different types of images. And why do you, have, do you need to call your bicycle a helicopter or yeah, your helicopter he, he himself bicycle. does not he himself does not insist that it's an icon actually no okay i'm just saying like it's some some general yes overall observation like it has a form of an icon because it's made on a board with a frame formally it's painted as an icon but from point of view of how it functions it is not because it's not uh it's inviting you too much for sympathy, empathy, and other feelings, which usually icons do not awaken. Interesting. How do you know then, how, how do you know then, how do you know then know the rules? How do you know, how do you then know the rules? Yeah, forgive me. <laughs> How do you then know the rules? Forgive me. No, I do not know the rules. I'm not sure there are rules. I only have certain considerations which I have 
grasped, I have I know, learned from what I used to see from icons. I have seen many, many, really many of them. And there are certain types of messages we see and certain we do not. So I never saw any icon with a specific psychological load. Even in events, like we talk about Judas kiss, yes, which is very highly loaded event, which could show lots of psychology, empathy or antipathy. No, they remain even. They do not make conclusions. They allow you to make conclusions for that. And they do not invite you to emotions. So there are no emotions, usually. Sorry. Uh -huh. Okay, but uh, further development. Of pro I'm, I didn't mean to overtake this. I mean, <laughs> please ask, but send questions sure. in. You know, I'll shut Move up forward. as soon as the questions would arrive. No, no, it's okay. Um, uh, for instance, if we're talking about the earliest Christian art, the art of antiquity, um, it has no visual message except telling of the story, the earliest, for instance, uh, carvings from Cleveland Museum of Art, Jonah and the whale, well, story of Jonah or Good Shepherd. Rosano just, Codex, wonderful thing, yes. Very, very, Or catacombs very, paintings, yes, exactly. Very plain, uh, in, graphically, there is no any other message than in any, any other contemporary to that period art. Then when but we they are not icons. Well, but they are really, but that's where icons come from. No. Yes, of course. But the genre, it's the genre of carving, genre of wall painting. These are different goals. Image you stick to the wall functions in one way, an image you place in front of yourself or in the middle of the church functions differently because the one which is on the wall is part of the wall. The one which exists by itself is just a specific tool for prayer. It used to be for centuries. You can put together, well, and unfortunately, I can't show certain things because all my USB ports are busy now. Sorry, but I should have shown some images from my lectures. The same, let's say, baptism image in a book illustration will look differently than it looks in a fresco, than it looks in an icon. Because in an icon, in order to let you stay in peace, they balance perfectly this little or huge space. So your eye has no temptation to go away. Your eye just wants to stay, to dwell there. And they do it visually. They perform this job through their professional skills. While in a building on a wall, you connect, you have to connect your image to the rest of the building because it's the, it's how otherwise it's part of the wall. So it's just logical thinking and to, how to say, I have no other explanation. So why otherwise? <laughs> All right. Can you write these words and explanations into a book with your words and comparison photos? They make so much sense, but it helps me to be reminded. Is it uh, a request from yourself? Demand. No, that's a that's a suggestion from someone who's It present. takes time. If I had someone who could help me <laughs> writing book, yes, but it, it really takes too much time writing book. I, I rather prefer painting and drawing and sometimes teaching, but mostly it's, yeah, well, it, it needs to be written someday, but maybe when I grow up, grow old and bold totally and <laughs> someday maybe, yes, thank you. All right, all right. Well, uh, uh, dear friends, are there any more questions? Are there? Hello, are there... Deborah, happy to see you. Hello, Seattle. <laughs> All right, all right. Peter, are you still here? Father, Father Ilya, can I ask those who know me just to, I don't know, switch on the cameras and say hello? Yes, absolutely. No, I, oh, there's thank no, you. you know, anybody could enable their camera. No okay, problem okay. There. thank you. Well, if there's no special questions we are supposed to discuss, we can just talk. 
or just say hello. So I'm happy to see on one screen people from Seattle and from Melbourne and from so Charleston and Keith. Yeah, well, so, so, so many wonderful people. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining. And I, I bet Kathleen is also here. Vladimir, здравствуйте. Да, я тоже рад, что вы здесь, но камеры вашей нет. So thank you everybody for coming. If you'd like to say something, I don't know, personally, not to ask Father Ilya to read, but just to say in words, I think now we have this possibility. Yes, you can unmute yourself and I probably will stop recording so we can go into private session or more private. <laughs>